So yeah, I will be talking this time about uh, adversarial methods in natural language processing. And this is a, a very broad uh, variety of methods um, that can be used for various uh, different things. Uh, but in order to talk about it, um, first I'm going to talk about kind of the broader framework of generative models. And this framework of generative models, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, this time and next time. So basically, generative models uh, try to model a data distribution, uh, p of x, or a conditional one, for example, p of x given y. Uh, and in addition to this, um, latent variable models are models that introduce another variable, z, and model the probability of x while summing over or integrating over the, um, the latent variable z here. And generative models, uh, we've already talked about a pretty wide variety of generative models, um, including standard language models that um, generate, uh, that calculate the probability p of x uh, and can be used to generate uh, sentences or other things like this. But Talking about generative models and latent variable models, a perfect generative model is one that should be able to do various, uh, various things. So for example, uh, one thing it should be able to do is evaluate likelihood. Uh, so it should be able to calculate p of x, including you know, um, our standard language models that we've talked about so far. And you can calculate the perplexity of these. And another thing they should be able to do is generate uh, samples. So they should be able to generate um, a sample x from this probability distribution p of x. Another thing they should be able to do, um, especially if it's a latent variable model, is in infer uh, these latent variables. So this means you have a probability of z given x. And uh, one example of doing something like this would be inferring the topic of a sentence in a topic model. Um, and I'm going to give some other examples of this in, in a second. So there are a number of different uh, generative models. And what we've talked about so far are non-latent generative models. Um, they should be able to uh, calculate likelihood. And in general, the non-latent generative models that we've talked about so far can be quite good at calculating likelihood. And in fact, um, most of the models with the best perplexity have no concept of latent uh, variables at all, with a few exceptions. Um, for generation, um, it's specifically, I guess, if we look, think about uh, image uh, generation, which is not the topic of this class, but um, it's a widely used testbed for these models, um, Non-latent uh, generative models can do kind of okay at this. They can generate pretty uh, somewhat reasonable looking things. However, uh, non-latent uh, generative models have uh, very, are very poor at, or like have no ability whatsoever to calculate uh, latent variable z because they have no concept of latent variable z. Um, in contrast, uh, the two models that, I'm, or the two, uh, I guess frameworks that I'm going to talk about uh, this time and next time. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about generative adversarial networks, and next time we're going to be talking about VAEs. These are generative models that have a concept of, uh, of a latent variable. Um, so with respect to likelihood, uh, VAEs are, uh, are pretty good at this. Um, here I, I say double star, but actually VAEs can be pretty competitive with uh, non-latent models if you uh, train them correctly. Um, but it's a little bit harder, I guess. Um, GANs do not have a really easy to evaluate concept of likelihood. Um, on the other hand, with respect to generation, specifically image generation, uh, GANs are very, very good at this. Um, and uh, VA is a little bit less so for reasons that I'm going to talk about soon. And um, with respect to inference, uh, VAEs are, uh, are good at inferring latent variables if you, uh, if you train them appropriately. 
So this is kind of a high level overview and I'm going to go into the, the details of each of these. So maybe we can revisit this at the end of uh, the next class. Um, but uh, to give an example, oh, and sorry, one more, one more thing that I forgot is that the um, non-latent and VAE style models use maximum likelihood estimation or the lower uh, bound on the maximum likelihood in the case of VAEs uh, to train the models. Um, whereas GANs are, uh, are trained in a, a different manner altogether. And to give an example why people have been uh, excited about uh, generative adversarial networks, um, you can see the, uh, the MLE-based models. Uh, we have the real image on the left. We have an MLE-based models reconstruction in the middle and an adversarial models uh, reconstruction on the right. And what you can see is basically the MLE-based model generates uh, kind of fuzzy, uh, fuzzy style image, uh, images that um, kind of get the average of, uh, the average of features, but don't really um, you know, emphasize uh, or get like sharp contrasts or things like this. And the, this isn't necessarily a bad thing if you're training your model using maximum likelihood. So to give an example that I talked about before um, in the context of natural language processing, if somebody asks you, um, or if you are a dialogue system and somebody asks you, what is your name? Then um, uh, maybe the answer is my name is Graham. Maybe the answer is my name is John. My, maybe the answer is my name is Mary. Um, but that there are lots of different options there, uh, but the kind of more uh, safe option uh, that could apply to many different speakers is I don't know. So MLE trained models tend to go for kind of the, the safe uh, thing that is high likelihood and doesn't make a lot of bold decisions. And uh, generative adversarial nets are uh, essentially a way uh, that had been proposed to fix this. So the way the training uh, works is um, we, the, we have the basic idea, create a discriminator that criticizes some aspect of the generated output. And um, this is with respect to kind of adversarial learning methods in general. Um, so generative adversarial networks um, are create models that criticize the generated output. Sorry, actually, maybe I shouldn't have called this slide adversarial training. Adversarial training has kind of a different, uh, a different um, implication, but like adversarial methods, let me put it that way. Um, so gener generative adversarial networks have a discriminator that criticizes the generative, generated output, um, whereas adversarial feature learning has, uh, basically criticizes the generated features uh, to find some traits. So, you know, neural networks, are basically feature learners and you run a discriminator over the features that are uh, created by the model. And I'm gonna talk about both of these in the following slides. So this is kind of a high level overview. Are there any questions at the moment or, okay. Okay, I don't see any, uh, I don't see any questions, so I'll, I'll continue. Um, so first, I'll, I'll talk about generative adversarial networks. And um, the basic paradigm of generative adversarial networks uh, is we have the two models, the generator and the discriminator. And basically, the discriminator, given an image or an output, I guess, is to, tries to tell whether it is real or not. So the discriminator calculates the probability that the image is uh, real instead of generated. And the generator, on the other hand, tries to generate an image that fools the discriminator into answering real. So the desired result at convergence here is that we have a good generator that generates images that are so good that the discriminator cannot tell whether they're real or not. And if you've done that, then you basically have a good generative model, right? You know, it's generating images uh, that, that, seem, uh, that seem reasonable. That's a slight oversimplification, but um, uh, you can kind of say that. 
Um, so the generator uh, it, it convergence, we have a generator that generates a perfect image and a discriminator that cannot tell the difference between these images. So what is the training method for this? And the training method, basically, um, we have our data base, our, set, our data set. And from this, we sample a mini batch like we always do. And this is uh, Xreal. Then um, we have a latent variable sampler. Maybe this is just a, a normal distribution or something like this. And we sample latent variables uh, from this uh, normal distribution. And then we take these variables, uh, we convert them uh, with a generator into X fake, which are basically the, um, the outputs that uh, uh, like fake out, uh, automatically generated outputs. And based on this, um, we predict uh, with the discriminator um, what, whether we think the image is real or the images in the mini batch are real or fake. So the discriminator loss is high if you uh, fail predictions. And the generator loss is high if uh, the predictions are correct. So in other words, the generator is trained to try to reduce the probability of uh, the prediction uh, being correct about fake. And then uh, we use the gradient. And we let the gradient flow um, from the discriminator loss, we let it flow into the discriminator. And from the generator loss, we uh, let it flow into the generator. So to express this in equations, um, what does this look like? We have the discriminator loss function. And uh, in the discriminator loss function, we would like to predict uh, real for real data. Um, so in other words, we would like to um, maximize the probability of predicting uh, real for things that are sampled directly from the data distribution, uh, from the real data distribution. And then for uh, on the right side, we would like to predict uh, fake for fake data. So we have the data sampled um, instead from uh, the generator Z. So you can see that we sample Z uh, according to the, uh, we take the expectation over all latent variable Z. We convert them using the generator. And we, um, we have a discriminator. Uh, and we want to minimize the or maximize the probability of uh, or minimize the probability of keeping. On the other hand, our generator loss function uh, basically we want to make the generated data uh, le less likely to be uh, um, classified as fake. So, in other words, um, the generator loss is the opposite of the discriminator loss. On, um, uh, and we, we want it to, uh, but, well, sorry, there, there's a couple ways of, of doing this. So one, one way of doing this is um, we basically want the generator loss to be the opposite of the discriminator loss. And um, so in order to do this, we basically optimize the generator to uh, try to uh, minimize to maximize the loss of the discriminator. So basically, then these two models are competing against each other um, so that the generator tries to fool the discriminator and the discriminator tries to not be fooled by the generator. Um, another option, basically, is you try to make the generated data more real. Um, so now you're not exactly competing against each other. You're not having the. Um, the generated data, um, you're not having the loss of the um, discriminator be exactly opposite to the generator, but rather you're just trying to make the generated data more real and you disregard the predictions on the, uh, on the real data. And this second loss function is, um, a better, is better when the discriminator is particularly accurate. Um, and the reason why you can think of this is basically the um, the loss of the discriminator at the very beginning of training will, will likely be uh, very low because right at the beginning of training the generator is is super bad so it's very easy to tell uh, discriminate um, like generated data from uh, the real data and because of this the loss function of the 
um, discriminator is very low, which also means the, um, the loss function of the generator is close to zero and has very little gradient. So in general, the second loss function here uh, tends to be the, uh, you know, a more stable or more widely used one. Um, are there any questions uh, so far about this? Okay, um, so I will continue then. Um, and so another way to interpret um, uh, GANs essentially is that they're trying to do uh, distribution matching. So uh, the way this uh, the way this interpretation works is um, we have uh, z sampled from p of z, where z can be any distribution. Um, and then we have our generator, um, or, which we're calling F here. It could also be, um, it could also be uh, G, as we mentioned before. And this is a deterministic function that takes this simple distribution um, probability of Z and maps it to a much, much more complicated distribution. And um, this complicated distribution is essentially the distribution of natural images or natural text or, or something like this. Um, and as a result, um, we have x, which is a random variable with an implicit distribution p of x, which is decided by both uh, p of z and f. So, um, the process uh, can produce any uh, complicated distribution p of x if you have a reasonable p of z and a powerful enough f. So the reason for this um, can become obvious if you remember the fact that neural networks are universal function approximators and can map any function into any other function. So that includes you know, mapping uh, randomly sampled variables uh, from a simple Gaussian distribution into natural looking images that uh, follow the distribution of natural looking images or text. So yeah, um, that, that's another view of, um, of GANs, for example. And this also means that you can theoretically, uh, using a GAN, evaluate the likelihood of, uh, of models. So basically, in order to uh, of, sorry, examples. Um, so how would you evaluate the probability of an example? Basically what you would have to do is you would have to identify the uh, z that generates x and calculate the probability of that z um, or the probability uh, density function value at that z. Um, the problem is, number one, this is not trivial to do because you have to find, you have to have some method of calculating uh, z given x. And number two, again, you know, empirically don't seem to be extremely good uh, likelihood estimators. So, um, and usually we don't uh, use them for this purpose. Um, okay. So next, I uh, will give a, a very brief overview in pseudocode. So we have uh, x of real uh, sampled from the training data. Um, we can calculate a random variable uh, according to a normal distribution or a uniform distribution. Um, based on this, we run it through the generator and generate x fake. Um, we calculate the discriminator for both the real and fake uh, data. And we calculate the loss function, as I uh, mentioned before, uh, for the discriminator and uh, then also for the generator using the non saturating loss. Yes. Uh, what, uh, so there was a question uh, why is P of Z usually a Gaussian distribution? Um, that's a good question. Um, it actually doesn't matter uh, that much. And the reason why it doesn't matter that much is because, um, regardless of the distribution, uh, no matter which distribution you have, if the generator is a sufficiently powerful neural network, it should be able to generate something that looks like the output that you want. Um, I think Gaussian 
as far as I know, Gaussian is, is more or less an arbitrary choice there. Um, in VAEs, uh, there, um, which we're going to talk about next time, there is a uh, nice uh, trick that you can use to backprop through uh, Gaussian distributions um, called the reparameterization trick, which is why they're used for VAEs. Um, but maybe they, uh, yeah, maybe um, uh, it, it's more or less arbitrary for GAMs. Um, another question. Um, so why do we take the expectation with respect to the data and the GAM loss? Um, so I guess that would be the loss function here. Um, so the reason why we take the expectation with respect to the data, I guess, is um, simply because that's what we do most in most training of neural networks. Um, the, in the training of neural networks, you know, we're taking the expectation of the loss uh, of the likelihood with respect to the, um, uh, with respect to all the data in our training corpus. And um, that allows us to get as accurate an estimate as we can about the distribution that we want to model. So um, what we would like to do, um, what we would like to do is essentially we'd like to um, uh, match the distribution exactly, but all we have is our training data. Um, so we, we try to match the distribution of the training data as closely as possible. So th this, in this particular case, this is not actually different from uh, normal MLE. We're doing the same thing in, in normal MLE as well. Um, following up to the first question, has anyone tried discrete latent variables for GANs? Um, that's a good question. Let me think about that for a little bit. I mean, the, the, best, um, the best example of discrete latent variables for GANs that I can think of um, is going to be some of the things I'm going to talk about in the um, in the future uh, for like training GANs for like sequence sequence modeling tasks or semi-supervised sequence sequence modeling tasks. I don't know about anything like a VQVAE, but there might, um, there very well might be. The argument against using discrete latent variables as opposed to, um, uh, as opposed to continuous latent variables is continuous latent variables theoretically could model any distribution because they have, you know, infinite granularity. So um, continuous latent variables would allow you to, to model any distribution in the distribution matching sense here. If you have a discrete latent variable, you wouldn't necessarily be able to model any distribution because the number of discrete latent variables is fixed, even if it's very large. So um, that's a good question, though. I, I actually don't know the answer to that. And if there are references, it'd be great. Um, okay. Uh, oh, could I, I got a request to open my video. I actually, I'm sorry, I didn't realize my video wasn't open. So let me, let me do that. Um, hang on one second while I figure out how to, uh, how to do that in Zoom. Uh, there we go. Can people see my video now? Okay, great. Sorry about that. Yeah, um, I actually didn't realize my video wasn't uh, wasn't there. Cool. Okay. So, um, any other questions? Okay. Um, I, I will move on. Um, so. Um, okay. So yeah, why why are GANs uh, why are GANs good? Um, I, I think one of the reasons why they have been so successful is because um, the discriminator basically is a something like uh, a learned metric parameterized by powerful neural networks. So what what it's doing is it's learning a um, you know to discriminate between things that uh, look like um, they were, uh, you know, 
actually appearing in the training data versus things that were not in the training data. So they essentially can pick up on small uh, discrepancies um, that don't uh, that are very char characteristic of generated, uh, you know, um, outputs that do not appear in um, in real outputs. So one example from the image domain is the blurriness that I just talked about before, right? Um, so generated outputs tend to be tend to very often be blurry. Um, and that's something that's not super hard for a neural network to pick up on. So if that's very characteristic, um, it will very quickly identify that if it's blurry, it's probably generated. And that is something that the model should avoid. Um, to give an example from text, um, the, uh, in text, it's very common for uh, text generation models to generate repeated outputs if they they use particular types of decoding algorithms, et cetera, or are trained in a particular way. And so all the discriminator neural network would have to do is uh, identify that, oh, if the output is repeated, then that's probably a generated text. And uh, then it would be able to penalize that from happening as well. Um, so another good thing is that the generator has fine-grained uh, gradient signals to inform it about uh, what and how to improve. So for example, if there is blurriness, then the particular patches um, that were identified as being particularly blurry will be the ones that the discriminator used to make its decision. And because of this, the discriminator um, when you do backprop through the discriminator into the generator, those parts will also be the part that get the strongest uh, gradient signal uh, that they need to be improving. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of very nice uh, theoretical, uh, theoretical ideas about GANs. Um, on the other hand, there are um, problems in GAN training. Um, in kind of in general, training them uh, is notoriously difficult, even for images and uh, especially for text. So there are a few known problems um, that uh, there are now somewhat uh, solutions for. So convergence and stability. Um, there are solutions to this, such as the Wasserstein GAN and uh, gradient-based regularization. I'm not going to go into a huge number of details about these because some of these are somewhat image uh, dependent. But basically, Wasserstein GAN is a, a different formulation of the GAN uh, training objective. Um, but uh, but basically, the first uh, bullet like bullet point here: convergence and stability is that training uh, training the models itself is hard and, and tends to converge uh, poorly. Um, another problem is mode collapse in dropping. Um, so mode collapse, the, the problem of mode collapse is basically if all we need to do is generate a very natural looking image, we don't necessarily need to generate, um, need to be able to generate an image that's any different from the training data. So we could just, you know, randomly pick examples from the training data. And of course, the discriminator wouldn't be able to tell them apart because um, the training data, you know, they would be exactly the same as examples in the training data. So um, one way to uh, prevent this mode collapse is through something called mini batch discrimination. And uh, what this does is it basically looks at, um, looks at all the way across the mini batch. And if the mini batch consists of a whole bunch of uh, very similar examples, then that itself becomes a, uh, a sign that, um, that the generator has fallen into mode collapse and it, the model can be penalized accordingly to try to escape from this. Um, and there's other uh, methods as well. And another problem is uh, overconfident discriminators. And um, the, the problem is right at the very beginning of training, uh, the discriminator will be very, uh, very confident in its predictions of fake, for example. Um, and this causes uh, essentially, uh, essentially gradient uh, collapse. 
and um, uh, or the it causes the gradient flow to not be good. So what you can do is you can uh, use label smoothing, which basically encourages the model to uh, the discriminator not to be so confident in its predictions. So there's a bunch of these uh, a bunch of these tricks that can be used. Um, and most of these were uh, tested on images. Um, however, I'm going to be spending most of the time here because this is an NLP class talking about um, applying uh, these methods to uh, text now that we have the background. Um, and not just GANs, but also other varieties of uh, adversarial uh, methods. So the first thing that we can do, the first kind of straightforward thing that we can do for adversarial learning is applications of uh, GAN objectives uh, to language. And um, for example, there's work on GANs for language generation, um, GANs for machine translation, um, GANs for dialogue generation, uh, et cetera. Um, and the basic training paradigm is very similar to what I just talked about. Uh, we sample a mini batch, uh, we sample latent variables, we convert them with a generator, predict with a discriminator. Um, but the problem in text, like I, I've talked about uh, several times before, is that because we are generating discrete variables um, using either argmax or sampling, we cannot backprop uh, through this generation of discrete variables. And so, yes, this is a problem. Um, so the solution to this, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, is to use learning methods um, for latent variables. And these can be any of the learning methods that I've talked about before, you know, um, reinforcement learning style methods uh, using policy gradient. Um, Another uh, variety of, um, of methods that people have used before is using re reparameterization tricks uh, for latent variables using the Gumbel suffix, which uh, I'll be talking about uh, maybe in a later class. Um, so, but anyway, I think the most common uh, method for doing this here is, uh, is just you know, applying some sort of policy gradient uh, method in, with some stabilization tricks that I'm going to be talking about in a bit. Um, the second problem that we need to handle when applying these methods uh, to sequences is uh, coming up with a discriminator for sequences. And um, this needs to decide whether a particular generated output is, uh, is true or fake, basically. Um, very often, uh, we, uh, people use CNNs for discriminators. Um, either on sentences or pairs of sentences. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, I had a, a question. So um, is Professor forcing an adaptation of the GAN for recurrent neural networks? Um, so, so this is a good question. So Professor forcing um, basically uh, has a classification layer over the um, uh, yeah, actually, sorry, that, that should have been a third bullet in this slide. So um, the first method is policy gradient or reinforcement learning methods. Another thing is a reparameterization trick for latent variables. So basically, actually, maybe I, I can explain this here because I don't think I've explained it yet. Um, let me try to do a whiteboard. Um, Zoom, Zoom actually has a whiteboard, but it doesn't. Uh, uh, doesn't work uh, very well. Um, so I will, uh, I will use my whiteboard here. So um, so th this is the, the first, uh, the second thing on my bullet list here. Um, and basically, the, um, what the Gumbel softmax is about is it um, 
takes the, let me see. So it basically takes the uh, categorical distribution and it, um, if you took the expectation of the categorical, dis uh, or if you took the categorical distribution and took a single sample from it, you would, um, you would just get an output here that would be a one hot vector. Um, however, if you, um, it, instead of taking, the, um, taking a single sample, what you could do is you could um, modify this distribution. So basically it becomes something that looks a little bit like a one hot distribution, but it also applies a, a little bit of probability to um, other parts of the distribution like this. So um, uh, instead of taking a one hot vector itself, um, you take um, not exactly not exactly the one hot vector, but something that looks a little bit more like a probability distribution, and you multiply, for example, word embeddings by this uh, by this distribution here. Sorry, I, this is kind of hard to do without a whiteboard. My uh, my two trustworthy whiteboard apps are both uh, not working right now. But um, anyway, I'm, I'm happy to uh, explain this a little bit more offline if people are interested after reading the paper. Um, so basically, th what this does is this applies to the predictions of the model. So the model, um, uh, this is like predictions over the output vocabulary of the model. Um, I got another suggestion for the, the whiteboard app. I, I will try that, but, but not now. Um, and so this, this is applied to the predictions over the probability vector in text generation, for example. Um, however, uh, Professor Forcing, um, the, um, what Professor Forcing uh, does is it rather um, has a discriminator over the hidden states. Um, it has a discriminator over the hidden states of the generated output. Um, so instead of discriminating the output itself, you're discriminating the, uh, the hidden states. So this is also good because then you can backprop directly into the hidden states. And because the hidden states are influenced by your previous predictions, um, you, you can kind of tell when you're getting into a bad, uh, a bad place that might not be uh, ideal uh, for training the models. So this is yet another uh, example of a, uh, of a method that could be used to uh, train these models. Um, I'll, I'll try to update, update this slide uh, later. Let me, let me take a note. Great. Okay, so um, now we need now we need a discriminator. Um, we can uh, commonly use uh, CNNs, uh, convolutional neural networks, as discriminators. Um, these can be either applied to sentences or pairs of sentences. So if you're just creating a generative model over text, uh, like for p of x, then you just need a discriminator over a single sentence. But if you're creating a um, sequence sequence model, for example, um, these can be uh, done across pairs of sentences. Um, and both of these uh, exist in the literature. If you want to do it over a pair of sentences, there are various ways to do this. Um, this particular method in 2017 uh, did this by stacking all the vectors together and running a two dimensional CNN over it. Um, now, you know, an obvious uh, choice would be to apply a uh, BERT uh, to send its fair classification or something like this. So, um, you know, basically any sentence classifier or sentence pair classifier could be applied to it this task. Um, so, I, I think based on this, uh, GANs sound really nice and attractive. Um, Unfortunately, they're not uh, super widely used in text. And I think part of the reason uh, in text processing, and I think part of the reason why is because 
even just training text processing models using reinforce where your reward is already known is, um, is hard, like I've talked about before. So minimum risk training to maximize the blue score of something of some generated text or, uh, or whatever else is already hard. And in addition to this, you also now have to train the discriminator at the same time uh, with all the difficulties of, of GAN training as well. So it, just uh, getting this to work well and stably is a non-trivial task. So um, to give an example, uh, this paper showed the, uh, the training of GANs with different types of discriminators and showed that the CNN-based discriminator they used uh, resulted in stable training, but uh, other ones uh, did not. Um, also, uh, the strength of the discriminator, um, as I mentioned before, if the discriminator is, uh, is too strong or too weak, um, then this can uh, cause problems. And I think there are, you know, solutions to this in the GAN literature now, but it, you know, you need to be uh, aware of this. Um, the uh, and specifically, you know, like using heuristic non-saturating losses instead of uh, instead of balanced losses and other things like this. But um, uh, yeah, so this is something to be aware of. Um, some other examples. So, what is the learning rate for the generator versus the learning rate of the discriminator it has had a big effect? Um, and the learning rate, uh, yeah. So, um, and the learning rate for the discriminator also had an effect. So um, there was a, a question, why does a stronger discriminator lead to worse training? Um, I, I think um, if I go back to my uh, slides here, um, I, I mentioned uh, the zero sum loss here. And if you're using the zero sum loss, um, the uh, making the generated data less fake, uh, this, if the discriminator starts out being very, very good, then um, you will not be getting very much gradient back to the, um, to the generators. So basically the, the loss of the discriminator will be basically zero. The loss of the generator will, which means the loss of the generator will also be basically zero. And um, it's hard to escape from that, uh, that original uh, output. Um, does that make sense? Um, okay, so um, so there because of this, there's um, a number of ways we can uh, can stabilize training. Um, one way we can do so is assigning rewards to specific actions. Um, so this was a trick that was used by um, uh, by you at all and others. And as I mentioned in reinforcement learning, one of the hardest uh, problems uh, in the talk about reinforcement learning is one of the hardest problems is about credit assignment. You know, which part of the, um, of the sentence is actually responsible for causing your high reward or low reward at the end, at the, uh, end of the sequence. And um, in GANs, fortunately, this is not, super difficult to, uh, to figure out. And one way you can do so is by basically looking at each of the prefixes and saying, hey, you know, discriminator, do you think this looks natural or not? And the, the discriminator says, um, uh, natural, natural, natural. And then you get to a word um, like fake, uh, which let's say it's highly indicative of a fake sentence. Um, and then the discriminator suddenly says, aha, I think this is a problem. So then you can kind of identify that this particular uh, point in the sentence was the point where actually the discriminator started thinking the sentence was fake. And um, because of that, you would assign a, a higher reward or, you know, to the generator for modifying that particular word where the discriminator thought it started thinking it was fake. Um, and this is, has also been uh, referred to, I believe, or I believe I've also referred to this as reward shaping in the uh, in the reinforcement learning lecture. So it's a variety of reward shaping. Uh, another stabilization trick, which again I talked about before, is performing multiple rollouts. So um, 
like other methods using discrete uh, samples, instability is a problem. And uh, this paper by you et al. Uh, 2016 also performed uh, multiple uh, rollouts. Um, so basically what they did was they, uh, they generated up to a certain point and then they had multiple actions. And then they uh, did search until the end of the sequence uh, based on the results of these multiple actions. And uh, the reason why they did this was so they would have, you know, a couple directly comparable uh, actions for each state, which would allow them to more stably uh, estimate the difference between these two actions. So yes. Um, yeah, and uh, another trick um, was discrimination over softmax results. So actually, maybe maybe this could also go into the the slide of, uh, of tricks to deal with non-differentiability. But um, basically, who at all 2017? Um, they were using controllable. Uh, they were attempting to do controllable text generation. So essentially. Uh, you know, try to generate text with a particular sentiment or something like this. And they instead used a discriminator, instead of doing it over the output itself, they used a discriminator over the softmax results. So um, you would take x, uh, you would convert it into um, uh, the hidden variable h, and then based on this hidden variable h, you would uh, calculate the, um, the softmax results and then the output uh, based on the softmax results. So instead of doing the adversary directly over the output, you would do it over, uh, over the softmax results, which are end-to-end -end differentiable. So you can just differentiate directly into them. So these are, um, these are a bunch of tricks uh, with respect to, uh, to applying GANs to text. Um, are there any other questions uh, so far? I don't see any immediately, so um, I'll continue on. And if there are, if there are any, please just type them in. Okay. So the the next thing that I'm going to talk about is um, adversaries over features, and this actually is very very useful and quite widely used in NLP, as opposed to um, uh, as opposed to you know, GAN style uh, functions, which are honestly not used uh, super widely at the moment. Um, so GANs, basically what they're doing is they're doing a, uh, a generation over the, um, uh, or they're doing an adversary over the generated outputs. Um, adversarial feature learning instead is doing um, uh, adversarial learning over some sort of extracted features. And I guess professor forcing would be one uh, example of this. Uh, so you're, you're learning over the, uh, over the RNN features. And um, why would you want to do this? Um, one example would be non-generative tasks. So we have tasks that, are, um, that aren't actually generating um, outputs like classification. Um, and uh, like as I mentioned before, with the uh, with the professor forcing, it, doing it over continuous features can be easier than over discrete outputs. So a very early application of this um, is learning domain invariant representations. So, um, for example, if we want to train a text uh, sentiment classifier over um, multiple types of Amazon reviews. Uh, for example, um, if a uh, if we had reviews in uh, the domain of books and reviews in the domain of movies and also reviews in the domain of like apartments or something like that, uh, I don't think they sell apartments on Amazon, but um, uh, in the domain of apartments, um, we would like to train a, uh, a model that basically can uh, learn in all of these domains and, and still uh, be robust uh, to, new, uh, to new domains. So in this um, uh, particular model, basically what they do is they uh, extract features, uh, F, 
and then they have the discriminator uh, try to discriminate which of the domains the feature came from. Um, and so your discriminator loss is trying to prevent the intermediate features from being distinguishable by the domain. So it's trying to remove the information about the domain from the features itself uh, with the expectation that this would not be useful for sentiment classification, for instance. Um, to give uh, one example of this um, from NLP, uh, one issue with NLP, oh, sorry, um, in the previous slide about, so in the previous slide about using intermediate features for the adversary, how do we generate the features for the real data in the batch? Um, so to be clear, um, this adversaries over features aren't doing any sort of generation of outputs. Mm -hmm. um, so the different GANs basically will will generate um, uh, will generate an output um, and try to distinguish whether the output mm -hmm. looks correct or not. In adversarial feature learning, um, you're trying to generate the features and try to do some sort of discrimination over, uh, over the features belonging to one domain or another. So an example here um, would be you take real inputs from the book domain, real inputs from the movie domain, and you try to make sure that their features cannot be discriminated um, uh, according to which domain they came from. And basically what that's saying is you want to match the distribution of the features uh, between the book domain and the movie domain. Um, ho hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, so to go back to the example, um, in uh, our, in NLP, we very often will be dealing with newer data or older data. Um, where the newer data is more relevant. So uh, this paper by Kim et al. Uh, trained a discriminator that tried to make the features from the old data and the new data not be distinguishable. Um, and so that ensured that your classifier can utilize the old data, but it won't be, um, you know, it won't, will kind of ignore the features of the gradually transitioning um, uh, vocabulary between the new data and the old data, for example. Um, another even more salient example is learning language invariant representations. So uh, for example, text classification, um, we have uh, English uh, inputs and Chinese inputs, and we run the joint uh, feature extraction extractor on the English inputs and the Chinese inputs. And then we have a sentiment classifier and um, in the sentiment classifier, uh, we'll try to classify sentiment, but we also have an adversarial language identifier, um, which uh, the discriminator tries to identify which language it is, and the generator tries to generate features so that the languages cannot be uh, distinguished from each other. Um, so this, uh, this seems like a, a very nice idea because basically that would allow you to um, uh, that would allow you to um, train a model that should work well on, on both languages, maybe even as, in a zero shot setting or a few shot setting. Um, and this has also been applied to other things like machine translation. Um, so another example of how adversarial feature learning um, can be used is um, in adversarial multitask learning. So actually, sorry, before I get to this, there's one caveat about adversarial feature learning. Um, and the problem, one problem with adversarial feature learning, um, can people see the whiteboard? Yes, okay, I see at least one person saying yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so the, uh, so one problem with adversarial feature learning is if you, so if we have P of Y given X, um, 
we, uh, we want to calculate this P of Y given X effectively. And basically what adversarial feature learning is saying is um, we will be calculating these features from X. And um, we want these features to not be distinguishable by domain. Um, but we still want to be able to calculate this P of Y given uh, HX effectively. Um, so the only problem is um, if we make these not distinguishable by, by domain, that also means that the marginal distribution of Y given that um, X is in the domain um, must be similar or identical across domains. Um, so in other words, to give an example, um, if all reviews of movies tend to be very good and all reviews of books tend to be very bad, then it would be a bad idea to completely filter out that domain information because you're losing, you're essentially losing a lot of information about your a priori belief in how good the, in like what kind of labels you should be expecting in that domain. Um, so, in other words, the, the distribution of, um, of the output label given the domain should be similar across any domains for which you're doing adversarial feature learning. Um, is that clear? Any questions? Okay. Um, so, um, in the adversarial multitask learning setup, um, there is a way around this. Um, so the basic idea, and this is actually by Peng, Peng Fei, the, uh, the co-instructor of the class. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask him about it, obviously. Um, but the basic idea is that we want some uh, features in a shared space across tasks and others separate. So um, basically the idea being that for some tasks, we uh, we, or for many tasks, we share features, but there are some tasks, uh, some features that are task uh, specific. And so we have task A and task B, the shared features are in the middle. And basically we, um, uh, we train an adversarial discriminator on the shared features. So um, you, you try to get the shared features to be in the same space. And then you also have ortho orthogonality constraints on the separate features. So this is trying to make the, um, uh, the separate features basically fall in a, a different, um, so they're independent of each other for the two, uh, two tasks, especially on, on similar data points, on the same data points. So um, this is good because like if there's some information that you think should be, should stick around because of, um, you know, it's useful like for classifying in a particular domain or performing a particular task or something, uh, this method gives you uh, a way that you can do so. Um, I, I think this is a kind of interesting, um, this is a kind of interesting example. It's not, uh, not everybody's interested in a discourse connection classification, but it's an interesting, clever example of a use of adversarial learning, which is why I, uh, I like to introduce it anyway. Um, but the idea is um, implicit, implicit discourse relations are like, for example, never mind, you know the answer. Um, and there's an implicit relationship between the first sentence uh, and the second sentence, which is because. Um, and so it's actually never mind, um, you know, uh, never mind, because you know the answer. And so the, um, the way they had this work is basically they had a bunch of text with explicit discourse connectives, like because they removed these implicit, uh, these explicit discourse connectives. And then they tried to uh, train the text classifiers um, uh, like 
features so that the text with the explicit discourse connective and the text with the implicit discourse connective uh, were indistinguishable in feature space. And, uh, you know, that, that's good because the model still has to be able to perform classification, but it will bring these, uh, these representations closer together. Um, so I, I thought this was kind of a clever, you know, combination of kind of data, data augmentation and adversarial learning that fit the task uh, very well. Oh yeah, oh, and actually I had a slide on professor forcing, but I already covered it, so uh, we can skip over that. Okay, um, are there any questions about these uh, so far? Um, so ne next I'm going to go into unsupervised distribution matching. Um, so uh, to get one of the major applications of unsupervised distribution matching is for unsupervised style transfer for text. And um, we're going to have a whole uh, class on this a little bit later. So um, maybe I'll just go through this very quickly. But um, basically, the task is to transfer sentences with one style to another style. Um, and do this without having any parallel uh, information. So for example, uh, in decipherment, uh, this would mean translating ciphered sentences to natural sentences. So um, you know, if we have a simple substitution cipher, how could we uh, recover, um, recover the original sentences? Uh, transfer sentences with um, positive sentiment to negative sentiment, um, do word reordering, uh, et cetera. So these are all tasks that they used in this particular paper. Um, and uh, basically the way they do this is they um, try to generate, uh, they try to have a generator that can output um, uh, like, they can take in text from one style uh, generate um, text in the other style and, and vice versa, and then run a discriminator over this. And basically the idea is you want to try to make the distributions over the generated text uh, from one style to another look like the original text in that particular style. So like you would try to decipher a sentence and make the sentence look very similar to the original um, uh, you know, un unciphered English text. Um, so like, as I said, we're going to go into a lot more detail uh, of the, in this, in a following class. So I, I won't cover it uh, too much here. Um, another thing is unsupervised alignment for word embeddings. So uh, one example of adversarial approaches to this is um, we have uh, word embedding spaces in different languages. So that's uh, shown in A here. And we want to define a function, for example, an orthogonal transform to map between the spaces. Um, so we use an adversarial loss to try to align uh, the two spaces together. So basically, we try to find the best uh, orthogonal transformation that makes these two spaces uh, look as similar as possible. Um, then in addition to this, uh, it's common to further find the closest words uh, in this aligned space and uh, then use a supervised objective to try to map these, uh, these words together. Um, but the adversarial part mainly comes in in, the, in part B here, where you're trying to align the two spaces to make their distributions look similar. Um, and then there's also unsupervised machine translation. Um, and unsupervised machine translation, again, we're going to talk about in a future class. So, um, but basically, we have a idea of um, we want to map from uh, like language one to language two, and then map from language two to language one so that the uh, inputs and outputs, uh, so that the mapped and mapped output look similar to the, uh, the original output. And that's called cycle consistency. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, uh, and then we have also have an adversarial loss over the mapped output, uh, to prevent it from learning something, uh, like a simple identity transform 
So the cycle consistency loss basically ensures that you maintain all of the information uh, needed to reconstruct the sentence. Um, and the adversarial loss makes sure that you can't just, you know, do an identity copy of the sentence into the output and reconstruct it in the input, because if you did this, uh, then your adversarial loss over, uh, over the style would be very high. Okay. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, I, I'll, uh, we're a little bit short on time and uh, we'll be co covering that later. So I'll uh, skip over that kind of briefly. And uh, finally, um, adversarial robustness. So this is a, an interesting topic that uh, has been uh, focused on quite a bit recently. And um, one problem uh, that has been pointed out is that um, neural network-based NLP models are very sensitive to small perturbations in the, uh, in the inputs. So for example, um, if we look at the input uh, here, this is um, uh, a, a German version of the famous uh, sentence from Cambridge uh, University, uh, or talk, talking about a, a fictional study at Cambridge University where you uh, reordered the letters in the, um, in the input and this caused, uh, and humans are very robust to this sort of uh, reordering, but machines will break completely uh, when they try to translate something that has been manipulated in this way. Um, so this is an interesting paper pointing out the problem. Um, however, uh, you can go even farther and say we're not just going to be swapping characters, uh, but we're going to specifically design a type of noise that we apply to systems uh, so that uh, we do only a few character swaps, but try to break the system as much as possible. Um, so the way this works in, for example, image classification systems is you calculate the gradients um, and uh, and you basically try to find a, um, a small perturbation to the image that maximizes the loss. And this is, um, this is also easier conceptually in, image, uh, in images because if you just modify one pixel, for example, uh, that's not likely to change the underlying properties of the image enough that a human would notice the difference, but it might, uh, it might change it significantly for a machine. Um, so there's kind of a, uh, a very natural idea of like which images are close together or similar uh, semantically. Um, however, this is more difficult for, um, for text because the input is discrete. So, you know, if you change a single character in a sentence, um, uh, it, it could cha entirely change the meaning uh, of a word. Uh, and I, I'm sure it's, uh, you can come up with several examples of this. Um, so here, here's an example. Um, I, I think this is a, uh, it, it's, an, it's an interesting example that demonstrates how you can uh, easily fool these systems, but it also points out that this is kind of, uh, like why this is kind of a, uh, a difficult um, problem in text. So you can see this, the original source and the adversarially manipulated source. And um, <clears throat> the original word in the, um, in the top sentence here was Augusta, um, and it was changed to Afui Gusta. Um, uh, and in the original sentence, this was correctly translated into Augustine, but in the adversarial sentence, it was translated into Rutgers. So um, that's a, that's, you know, a bad mistake, I guess. Um, but also is Afui Gusta really an okay transformation of this? It's a, it's a little bit not, uh, not very clear. Um, so we, we have a study on this, um, talk, thinking about adversarial examples. And uh, the way we uh, define adversarial examples for text is uh, that these adversarial examples should be meaning preserving 
on the source side um, and meaning destroying on the target side. So we have to have a, a formal definition of this, obviously. And so we want to say that um, <clears throat> one minus the, uh, the similarity in the source is, um, is less than or equal to uh, the uh, target meaning destruction. And what we mean by target meaning destruction is we have the similarity of the target um, between the original um, or the, the similarity between the target output with the original source and the similarity between the target output with the in the um, <clears throat> in the adversarial source should be or sorry the the simil we have a, a reference output and we calculate the similarity between the um, the reference output and the output obtained by the system uh, using the modified source and the reference output and the output obtained by the system using the uh, the original source and we would like the output of the modified source to be much less similar to the reference essentially and so um, that's what we uh, that's how we define this uh, distance here and um, then this has, this begs an obvious question: um, How do we define semantic similarity in the first place? And um, the uh, the difficulty is in text. You know, semantic similarity is very hard to define. You know, a single character swap might have very little effect on uh, semantic similarity, or it might have a huge effect on on semantic similarity if it changes one word into a completely different word with a different meaning. Um, so we discuss this a little bit in this paper, and we come up with several metrics and evaluate them against human uh, human simula similarity. So if you're uh, interested in this, I highly encourage you to take a look at the paper. Okay, and then uh, finally, I'm going to talk about adversarial training. So this is uh, this is what I mean, meant by, or this is what is often meant when you say actual adversarial training. Um, so we would like to train our models to be robust to uh, any sort of adversarial attack that somebody might throw at us. Um, one example of why you might want to do this is, um, for example, on social media, if you know that your users are going to be messing with your, um, with your translation system or your spam classification system or something like this, um, you'd like your model to be robust to whenever people uh, do this. And um, the simplest idea for how to do so is um, to use the fact that you can use, uh, you can find adversarial examples using gradient-based methods or other, or other methods and sample them at training time. And then train your model to be robust to these adversarial methods at training time. Uh, so you simple an adversarial perturbation to your input um, and then train your model to be able to classify correctly despite that uh, adversarial perturbation. Um, there's some very nice theory uh, regarding this, and you can actually show that um, this simple idea is an optimal method for training adversarially robust models. Um, uh, but unfortunately, there's very little of this theory with respect to NLP tasks. Um, uh, and part of the reason why is because, you know, defining semantic similarity or any other uh, sort of metric is kind of non-trivial. And you actually might ne even need a model-based uh, semantic similarity evaluation function in order to do this. But I think there's lots of interesting um, potential future directions in this area. And uh, if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk about this uh, more at office hours or, or other things. Um, also, uh, Zico Coulter at CMU uh, has a very nice tutorial um, on this that lays out the problems very clearly. So I, I'd also uh, recommend this as well. Okay, so uh, that is all I have for today.
Um, I'm happy to take any questions. We have a few minutes. Um, does anyone have any uh, final questions?